This is Brent, Alan Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com. Coming to you today from the Green Mountains in the state of Vermont. The Green Mountains, the home of Ethan Allen, the man who with his small band from the Green Mountains bluffed the British general of Ticonderoga into surrendering the entirety of the country of Canada into the hands of the Americans. Yes, indeed, the entire country. And for about a month, one glorious month, Canada was part of the United States under the authority of the Congress of the United States. But I've discovered that the Canadians don't feel the same way about me and us as I do about them. I like them very much, the ones I've met, and I've often wished that we were all one big happy country. We have subsisted that way for many decades until recently. We passed back and forth across the border, even though we were two countries. We had a commonality, a strong commonality, and that commonality, by the way, rested upon our law, called our common law, the law of the land. Lex Terra, as some people say, the land law, as Stephen Lagington put it in Magna Carta. Now, we are more British than are the Canadians. The Canadians didn't stay with us during that struggle called the War for Separation from the Empire of Britain. Canada remained a part of that empire. No, not a part of England. Very much different. King George was not king in Canada. He remained emperor. He was king in England and limited by the common law. But the powers that be and the leading personalities in England said that the common law did not apply in our American plantations. Our American plantations, I'm quoting Blackstone, William Blackstone, his commentaries on the law of England, volume one. And those American plantations included, of a surety, the 13 original colonies of the United States to become states, those 13 states, and included also the settlements, the plantations of Canada. In those days, all of those settlements were Together, contiguous, of course, they joined one another territorially and were part of the British Empire, albeit our Declaration of 76 complains of Quebec, and Congress addressed the problem with the Quebec Act, our Declaration of 76 claiming, and rightly claiming, that Parliament and King intended to establish, and did establish, the law of the city, the law of Rome, the law of Babylon, through the canon law of the Roman Church in the province of Quebec, and our Declaration of 76 says they did that with full intention of extending that foreign law and jurisdiction into these colonies. Yes, indeed, America is America. Demanded. We are separated from Britain because we demanded in those days that we be able to enjoy the rights we have, our Constitution, as our Congress put it on the 14th of October, the year 1774, our Constitution. The common law, along with, most pronouncedly, said our Congress in those days, most pronouncedly, along with, the right of an estimable value and worth, trial by jury. And here we are, chapter 39, chapter 40, where those that have gone before us claimed that right and told King John he must sign and agree to insure it toward us. 39 and 40 in the original issue, 800 years ago this year, 800 years on the 15th of June, the year 1215 on that low island on the Thames River, that flat part of it called the Plain of Runny Mead. Chapter 39 said no one, no one is to allow, in substance this is the result, no one is to allow any man's life, liberty, or property to be taken without two things. No, not one. It does not say or. It's not either or. It's and. The Latin preposition, bell, it has been shown conclusively, especially at that time in history, it was used to mean and. It wouldn't make sense otherwise anyway. Two things must happen. He must have... Trial by a jury of his peers. No, that's not equals. It's often translated that way. No, not equals. Pairs is a better translation, but it means those with whom you are familiar and those of whom are familiar with you. Your neighbors, for crying out loud. 
That's number one. Number two, it must be done according, as our Northwest Ordinance of 17 and 87 says, according to the course of our common law. What is the course of our common law? Well, chapter 39 says it's the law of the land, Lex Terra, lifted direct from our common law, anciently, put in Magna Carta, the year 1215. Our Constitution of the United States, lifting it direct from Magna Carta, putting it in English, of course. Article 6 says, Our Constitution is the supreme law of the land. What that means is this. It does not mean that it is a list of laws. It means that due process covers, controls everything that happens according to to the course of the common law, as it says, Northwest Ordinance. Indeed, everything must be done according to the proper process. And it is the maxim of our common law that if the proper process is adhered to, because our common law is not result-oriented, it's not result-oriented, no, it does not commit itself to reaching the result the state demands by command, by legislation, no, it commits itself to a process. Let the chips fall where they may. That's different. All of the rest of the world is result-oriented. Our common law is process-oriented. We concentrate on the process, not the result. Those two things. Well, chapter 40 then goes on and makes other observations. Remember, the laws of nature and the laws of nature's God constitute two volumes. Here in Magna Carta, we're dealing with the laws of nature and the people at that time that drafted it, and most notably Stephen Langton, the man who gave us our chapter divisions of our Bible, Stephen Langton drafted Magna Carta. And after recording the observations of chapter 39, that means heading 39, chapter in the old language, he puts chapter 40, heading 40, says this, very short, and it is a bit of an explanation and an addition that upholds supports trial by jury according to the course of the common law. He said this, to no one will we sell, to no one will we refuse or delay right or justice. Right or justice. Wow, what words. Hope to tell you why in a minute. It says here, to no one will we, we, no, King John is the one signing this. This is him supposed to be talking here. No, when he says we, it doesn't mean he has a mouse in his pocket. Obviously, the man's not pregnant. We, plural, means myself and those following me who will bear the sovereignty called the powers that be. We use the word sovereignty in our common law. Not in an absolute sense, because the word itself is the absolute sense. It is said that if you look up the word sovereignty, sovereignty, in that special edition of Encyclopedia Britannica, if you look it up, you'll discover that sovereignty amounts to one thing, the maker of heaven and earth and all that in them is, God himself. Not any God, the God, the God that made all things and controls all things, the God of all, not some, all authority, and all power, and all dominion. Only he is truly sovereign, but among men, we use the word sovereignty in the limited sense, because the sovereignty of the governments of men is by necessity limited by the absolute sovereignty of God. When John says we, he's talking about those who would hold sovereignty, powers that be in England after him, and that includes, of course, all those setting in the executive power in England called the crown, in the United States called the presidency, and later on, all of those in England holding power in parliament, because parliament, after the 17th century, parliament, every time it opens session, is loaned the sovereignty of England. That's why the queen today opens every session of parliament, and the crown is a part of Parliament in that sense. But still, when Magna Carta says we, it's talking about King John himself, the man who signed it, and his heirs and successors, as we say in our documents today. Same idea. Heirs and successors to the sovereignty of England, the powers that be. To no one will we sell, to no one will we refuse or delay, right or justice. Let's start at the end because I want to get this in now since I committed myself 
to talking about right or justice. Now, some have observed, and rightly observed, that our English translation of the King James Bible and many of the other early translations that have set the pace and set the norm for good translations of our Bible and English never use the word right. Tis true. Now, the Latin word translated right here is, I'll say this loudly, no sense saying this softly. The Latin word here translated right is rectum, rectum, R-E-C-T-U-M. Now, the best known use of the word rectum, it is a term of medical significance and particularity. It means, most particularly, the large intestine. The large intestine, and anyone who went to school and took biology ought to know, ought to have been taught that the large intestine is at the end of the digestive tract, and compared to the small intestine, it is straight. Oh, it has a couple of bends in it, but other than that, it's not like the small intestine, which is indistinguishably tangled, just to look at it if you could see it. Having gutted a number of animals, especially at butchering time, and more so than any other animal, hogs, because a hog is more like a man antonomically than about any other. I can testify that his innards, as we call them, his guts, come, just as ours, in two parts. The large intestine, which is at the end of the digestive tract, and the small intestine, looks like, just a glance at it, at first glance, looks like an indistinguishable tangle. It isn't. It's just laid in there in such crookedness. More bends to it than a road through the Ozark Hills, or as here, a road through the Green Mountains. But the rectum, relatively speaking to the small intestine, the large intestine called the rectum, is straight. Straight. More like that road, that lone road that used to run between Dallas and Fort Worth. No curves. Well, that's the word translated right, and then it says, or justice. So right is the straight path, but justice is the same thing. In fact, let's carry this a little further. Now, Stephen Langton was a Bible student of no small means, the greatest and most well-known Old Testament commentator of his day and thereafter for quite a while. And as I'd alluded to earlier, he is the man that gave us the chapter divisions in our Bibles we still use today. He knew the Bible. It, he knew the Bible well, and he knew what it meant by what it says as much as any man in that particular day, and that's quite a bit. The Bible is that second volume of our Declaration of 76, The Laws of Nature's God, written, as Blackstone tells us. In that Bible, and we can look specifically at the Newer Testament to be more precise about it, although the Older Testament Hebrew and Aramaic carry the same meanings in more concrete form. The word translated just or justice in the Newer Testament is also translated righteousness. Those two words stress two different aspects of the same thing. To do right is justice, and to do justice is to do right. It is to shoot straight. Straight with what? Well, straight with the laws of nature and the laws of nature's God, tracking with them both. And those two, by the way, track together. Well, this right, or justice, it says here, to no one will we refuse or delay. Well, this is the ancient maxim of our common law. This is nothing new. The ancient maxim of our common law, we repeat it yet today. Justice delayed is justice denied, and that is why. Our Constitution of the United States guarantees Article 6, a speedy trial. Justice had come to mean your right to go to court and your path to get there, by the way. Our common law says must be straight and quick. No turns, not as one commentator said of the rising bureaucratic state in America. I believe it was Llewellyn. Llewellyn. He said the bureaucratic state administrative law takes a man off of the beaten path of the law, the straight path, deters him into the wilds of bureaucratic entanglement and briars. Magna Carta says, no, we're not to do that. This is Brent. Alan Winters, commonlawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break here 
on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com. Thanks for staying with us. We're in Chapter 40. Chapter, to use the old spelling of the word, means heading Chapter 40, Magna Carta. The Great Charter says this, To no one will we sell, to no one will we refuse or delay right or justice. Magna Carta was written in a hurry. A good many great documents were written in a hurry, and because it was written in a hurry, the context becomes even more important. Of course, it always is important, as a matter of fact. The three rules of interpretation most important, indeed, more important than any other rules of fundamental interpretation of a text, a writing, a writ of legal significance, whether it be Magna Carta, our Constitution, the Bible, or statutes. The most important three rules are number one, context, number two, context, and number three, context. And don't forget that a text taken out of context is a pretext Allow me to repeat that a text of writing taken out of context becomes a pretext. That is, a pretext is something that is an outward display that is false. A text taken out of context becomes a false interpretation, an outward display that does not reveal the inward context, that truth which is woven, as it were, into the words both warp and woof, from both directions. Now recall that our common law is only known in adversity. Unless there are real rights being violated, our common law doesn't come alive. Indeed, it can't even be seen. And the question here is, who is the bloody... And the question here is, who is the bloody plaintiff here? What is the real right, the duty, that is here being violated? It is this. Large sums of money the government was charging people to bring their cases into court. Oh, you want a writ of right? It'll cost this much to even be heard. Now, when you read the British commentators on Magna Carta, they take a different point of view of this than do the American commentators. By the way, I don't know why we say commentators, but we do. It seems it'd be easier just to say commenters. The ones that comment, the commenters. By the way, but in all events, the Americans differ on their view of chapter 40. Indeed, Americans differ on their view of the entire document, the writing called Magna Carta. But here in chapter 40, they differ in this respect. The British commenters are willing to justify large sums being charged for those who want to come into court. The American commenters, of the past anyway, were not willing to do that because they say, the Americans say, that to charge large sums of money to get into court is the selling of justice. Well, indeed, that's exactly what Magna Carta here says. And Sir Edward Coke, the British call him Cook, he was American-minded about this, and he said that's exactly what this means, but many Brits following have not agreed. Their minds have fallen prey to large government attempting to justify it. One British commentator said this. He comments this way. He says, If the royal courts charged higher rates than the feudal courts, that is, the private courts, sometimes Magna Carta would have called them, they supplied a better article. This man is saying this. You want good justice? you got to pay for it. Well, I don't believe that's the American point of view. That certainly wasn't Cook's, or if you want to be American, Coke's point of view. And then he says, especially if you want an expedited article of justice, you got to pay for it. You want to go to the front of the line, pay a little more. Well, that's true in bureaucracies, yes. If you want your corporate papers put through quicker than anyone else, you can pay an expedited fee. If you want your passport put through quicker than anybody else's, go to the front of the line, pay an extra fee, they'll do that for you. But should the courts be respecter of persons that can pay the fee as against those that cannot? I think not. But here's a British commenter that I thought had the right point of view. Oh, Hallam, he's well known. He says this, A law which enacts that justice should neither be sold, a law which enacts that justice shall neither be sold, denied, nor delayed, stamps with infamy that government under which it had become necessary. Allow me to read that again. A law which enacts that justice, that is, the right to go to court, 
shall neither be sold, denied, nor delayed, stamps with infamy that government under which it has become necessary. Well, if one fellow gets expedited because he pays more, is that the delay of justice for someone else? You bet it is. I often hear it said that government ought to be run like a private business. There wouldn't be so much waste if they did. Friends, neighbors, and relatives, that's empty talk. Government is not business for profit. If it were business for profit, that would apply. But government will never be run like a business for profit. No, not at all. And all such talk is emptiness and foolishness and a distraction. It's not going to happen. Government, by definition, is opportunity to plunder. That's what it is. It's a dangerous animal. George Washington, of course, made famous that point when he said that government is not eloquence. It is not persuasion. Government is force. What do you mean when he said that? He means government is guns and blackjacks and clubs and whips and cages called prison, jails, dungeons. That's what government is. By the way, government has no other tool to get its will other than force. And when force doesn't work, I should say force or threat of force. And when that doesn't work, the only option is to apply more force. Don't expect government in an attempt to get its will to do anything, but deceive? Oh, it'll try to persuade, won't get very far. It's more into deception. Threat of force, and then force, and then more force. You say, well, the government then is evil. Is that what you're saying? No, I didn't say that. By the way, government is good, if it's good government, and God wants men to live with good government, but it begins not in the state house, nor in the county courthouse, nor in the National White House or Congress, no, it begins in your body. You want to know about government? Read the book called James in the Bible. James tells you what government is. It is you, you, governing your tongue, your tongue first. And if you can govern your tongue, you can govern the rest of your body, says James. And if you can govern the rest of your body, then maybe you have the option of effectively governing your family. And government that goes any farther than that, and government that goes any further than that, is, as George Washington said, dangerous, yes. But it's out there, and the way to deal with it is keep it to a minimum. It has two jobs. Two jobs God gives jurisdiction to government over. Certain crimes, which the laws of nature and the laws of nature's God set forth, such as murder, arson, rape, and kidnapping. Yes, the Bible gives men jurisdiction over those. And, of course, national defense. And the Bible clearly sets that forth in the book of Numbers primarily, foremostly, and then also the book of Deuteronomy, and some in Nehemiah. The jurisdictional bounds of that particular activity called armed defense is there. That boils down to two things, justice and armed defense. Justice and armed defense. And both of those are the province of of what we today call, our Constitution calls it this, those members of the militia of the several states of the United States. Men who are able to rightly swear to defend their land against enemies, foreign, that means armed defense against foreign intruders, and domestic, that means willingness to serve on the jury and take injustices against themselves to court. That's the duty of every man. One British commentator says that men who say you shouldn't have to pay for justice want free justice. And he said, that's not right. What is free is worthless. Oh, he's confused. It's not free justice. Somebody has to pay for it, and it's usually paid for with tax money. That's what employs the judges, the administrators of the court. That's what a judge is supposed to be. That's what pays the jurors. That's what pays for the upkeep of the courthouse and pays the sheriff to keep security in the courthouse and order and hires the bailiff. It's not free. What's he saying? No, he's not thinking. And men willing to serve on the jury, that's not free either. Just because they get a couple of bucks a day or a couple of bucks an hour or whatever the pay is to serve on the jury, that hardly covers the cost of a man who could go out and work and make money. So he is coming in and donating his time to the cause. So indeed he's wrong and others are wrong when they say that those that say justice should be given without payment, delay, without cost, such people want free justice? No. Which is better, to provide plenty of courts wherein people can get justice, or provide bureaucrats to whom people can run and persuade to hammer their neighbors? Now that is closer to what 
Men think is free justice, but that's certainly not free, because you lose your freedom in that case, plus you lose your money paying for all the bureaucrats. Bureaucrats, remember, work for the executive branch of government. There are only three branches, the executive, the judicial, and the legislative. You want justice, you got a couple of choices. You can seek justice in the courts, before the jury, or you can be bureaucratic-minded and hire more bureaucrats to hammer your neighbors when you get mad at them, but never forget. If you're willing to use the government as a hammer on your neighbors because his dog doesn't have a leash, or because he's burning a fire in his backyard having a weenie roast and that bothers your sensibilities, or because you want somebody to hammer your husband or your children, So you call human and family services, and they throw your family members in jail, I've seen that, and you think that's free, you're kidding yourself. You've lost your freedom, they've got your name, and you're next on the list to be hammered. You want to turn your friends into the IRS, or your neighbors, or someone of whom you're envious, that happens a lot. Don't forget, the IRS will take your name, and then they'll be looking at you. So not only do you lose your freedom in such a situation, looking to bureaucrats, the executive branch, to get what you want, you lose your money because tax money pays for that too. You're better off to have plenty of courts open, absolutely open to everyone. And the courtrooms, the courtrooms of America and the county courts should be the public event that gets more attention than anything else. Public trials, speedy, without delay. Public trials, speedy, without delay. By the way, all of Chapter 40, Magna Carta, the principles herein stated, are part of our United States Constitution. We are not to refuse or delay justice. That is why Article 6 of our Constitution says that every man is guaranteed the right to a speedy trial. William Blackstone said of Anglo-Saxon England, back before 1066 A.D., in the Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Dane world of that time on that island, the boast of our common law was that it brought justice to the door of every cottage. Every cottage, yes, every. Some people called them cottiers, people who lived in little cottages and had less than five acres of land. Some people called them villeins, they still call them that. Some people called them serfs. Indeed, they were at the bottom of the totem pole, but not really until after the Norman invasion. In Anglo-Dane England, the Anglo-Danes, the common law which they practiced, as Justice James Wilson says, was much more sensitive to individual duties. Those are rights in property and property and rights. And there was a little court in every tithing, every tithing. That means every ten families, a little court then above that in every hundred. That became the townships in America of every approximately hundred families. And then a little court above that in the county, the county court, the county, the county court. But that little court down at the tithing, at the door of every cottier, every cottageman, every small man, allowed him justice and a judgment, a judgment by a jury of other cottiers, other villains, administered at the common defense. I continue to be amazed at what the British have said in recent centuries about Magna Carta, and especially about chapter 40. Saying we, that is the Americans, have read way too much into it. Well, we didn't. We Americans followed Edward Coke, of which there was no greater jurist in England. Maybe some is great, but none any greater. And the English historian of the law, Hallam, we followed him. Well, what was the problem? I'm quoting from a legal case in England in later years interpreting this chapter 40 of Magna Carta. They said this, apparently, there were some writs which could be had for nothing in those days, and others a mark, and other for others a mark or a half mark, would be charged. You see the Anglo-Saxons and Danes being Germanic, before the pound they used the denomination of money of the mark. This jurist goes on to say, while at least during Henry's early years, that is Henry the Third, there were others which were only to be had at very high prices. You couldn't get into a court without paying a lot of money. It says, we find creditors of that day promising the king of England a quarter or a third of the debts that they hoped to recover, just to get into court. But this man adds on the end, but this jurist adds, and rightly adds, in those early days, and I'm quoting, that the poor should have their writs for nothing, their day in court for nothing, was an accepted maxim. If you were poor, if you were a pauper, you could get into court for nothing. That is nothing to you. Somebody has to pay for it. We must add that. Now, that is true yet today in our courts, state and federal. If you make out an affidavit to the court... An affidavit, a sworn statement in writing, that you are a pauper, you can't afford to pay the fee that the court requires of all others. The 
The court is bound by law to let you in. That's the good news. This is Brent, Alan Winters, CommonLawyer.com. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break here for the third and final segment of this hour on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network. This is Brent, Alan Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's W www.commonlawyer.com. Thanks for staying with us for the second segment of this hour. We're talking about the laws of nature. The laws of nature, as Stephen Langton has recorded them, Magna Carta, the great paper, 800 years ago this year, 15 June, the year 1215. We're in the most well-known part of Magna Carta. Chapters 39 and 40, we're in chapter 40. Some of the smartest, most informed people say the most unusual false things. I'd pointed out that some British commenters concerning Magna Carta have absolutely run awry denying, saying the opposite of what this chapter 40 says. It says justice shall not be sold, refused, delayed, And some commenters, after doing a good job of explaining the historic background, say it does not say that. They say it says that justice may be sold. No, I kid you not. Listen to one of them. He says this of chapter 40. He says, It has been interpreted as a universal guarantee of impartial justice, to high and low, and because, when so interpreted, It has become in the hands of patriots in many ages a powerful weapon in the cause of constitutional freedom. He says this chapter 40 has become a powerful weapon in the cause of constitutional freedom, guaranteeing impartial justice to all. But he says that's not the proper interpretation. Allow me to read it again. It says, To no one will we sell, to no one will we refuse or delay a right or justice. Now I can believe him, or I can believe Lord Coke, Sir Edward Coke, the man upon whom our founders relied heavily, more heavily than any other, as a matter of fact. In his commentary on Magna Carta, he says that this phrase, to no one will we sell, to no one will we refuse or delay justice or right, he says that means to no one will justice be sold, delayed, denied, or refused. And he says that phrase there, no one, includes everyone. And then this commenter turns around and says that's not true. After giving an accurate rendition of the history behind this chapter 40. Well, allow me to end with what Sir Edward Coke says about chapter 40. He says, As the gold finer will not out of the dust threads or shreds of gold let pass the least crumb in respect of the excellency of the metal so ought not the learned reader to pass any syllable of this law in respect of the excellency of the matter. What is he saying? He's saying this, as should be said of any writing of legal significance, every word must tell. There are no superfluous words in a writing of legal significance. And when it says, as here to no one will we sell justice, that means no one. Every word must tell. We come now to chapter 41, Magna Carta. Chapter 41, out of 63 chapters, we're through most of it. This is one of the longer ones, one of the longer chapters, a full two sentences. That's longer. But these sentences are long also. It it makes a respectable paragraph. It looks like one. Allow me to read it. And after we read it, then we'll break it down pull it apart, expound it, try to elucidate it, then put it back together, and take a comprehensive view of it. All merchants, it says, all merchants shall have safe and secure exit from England, and entry to England, with the right to tarry there, and to move about as well by land as by water, for buying and selling by the ancient and right customs, Quit from all evil tolls, except, in time of war, such merchants as are of the land at war with us. And if such be found in our land at the beginning of the war, they shall be detained, 
without injury to their bodies or goods until information be received by us or by our chief justicar how the merchants of our land found in the land at war with us are treated. And if our men are safe there, the others shall be safe in our land. This chapter 41 refers to a practice common among nations at war, I recall. A man by the name of Cook, a fellow I used to know, he's gone now, big fellow, became a basketball player here in the United States at a college out in California. When he was 14 years old, he traveled with his mother and his father from their home in Scotland to the mission field. They were Christian missionaries. They traveled to Hong Kong. Well, no sooner had they got there in the Far East than the United States and Britain declared war on Japan. Well, when war was declared, they were on the ship. They had taken passage in and had arrived in a port in the Far East. They hadn't even gotten off the ship yet when the Japanese soldiers came on board and took them prisoner because they were in the land of Japanese occupation at the time the war began. Well, that's the situation, and by the way, stayed in a prison camp the duration of the war. But that's the situation of which this chapter 41 speaks. What are we to do with merchants who are in our land at the time, we declare war on another nation, or another nation declares war on us. Now, in those days, the control of commerce between nations and merchants and the merchandise is an important part of this whole problem. The control of all of this was reserved to the personal supervision of the executive power of England, namely the king and all of his men, his bureaucracies. And there didn't seem to be any check upon the way he went about carrying out this duty. Consequently, merchants and merchandise had suffered from John's greed when war was declared, or even when war had not been declared. John just took whatever he wanted from merchants, even in time of peace, if they were from another country and he wanted what they had. Bottom line, the law of the land didn't seem to apply the law of the land, yes. Due process, and remember, due process is not a part of our common law as much as it is our common law. Our common law is a law of process, a law of how things are to be done, not what is to be done so much. So the privilege of trading in England and the personal safety of foreign traders was within the imperious, fickle will of the king. Very dangerous for them. And no foreigner, no alien, could enter England or leave it, nor take up any dwelling in any town, nor move from place to place, nor buy and sell without paying a heavy toll, toll and money to the king. And this royal prerogative proved exceedingly profitable for the king. All he was doing was, as organized crime, demanding protection money. Then also the the crown of England, the powers that be, gave special favors to certain merchants from other countries and disallowed other merchants from even coming into the country, and by so doing, limited the goods and services available to English people. The same thing happened in the American colonies. Same thing, different people, just different names. The crown of England, Parliament, forbade Americans from trading with anyone except the company of which Parliament and the King allowed them, namely the British East India Company. Well, if an American wanted a cheaper price, competition wasn't an option. He couldn't buy his books, his tea, his rice, even his rum from someone, some trader who would bring it to America and offer it cheaper. That was forbidden. The British East India Company had absolute monopoly of trade with all of the British Empire. Of course, the company's interest was held by those who made the laws in England, and so those that controlled England, Parliament, and the Crown used the British Navy and the British Army. Their primary duty was to protect the British East India Company's trade, and at any given moment, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 
there was at least 2,400, that's 2,400 British East India Company merchant ships on the high seas. That does not mean in port someplace. That means ships on the high seas. And the competition with the Dutch East India Company was fierce, and at any given point, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, there were approximately the same number, 2,400 Dutch East India Company ships on the high seas. And understand, the reason for this monopoly was not calculated to make sure that those in the American colonies or any place else in the British Empire got all the goods and services they could get at the best price. No, the object was to line the pockets of the powers that be in England. And they did so. All, of course, at taxpayers' expense, including putting in service the British Army and Navy to protect this trade and this company throughout the world. That was their chief job. Well, the same thing had happened in the days of King John in the 13th century, 800 years ago this year. The powers that be in England were controlling merchants, only allowing certain ones in from other countries, who were willing to pay and line the pockets of the powers that be in England, thereby denying competition, cheaper prices, and lots of goods and services to Englishmen. And Magna Carta here sets forth the policy of protecting all foreign traders and merchants in England, especially, and their goods, at the outbreak of a war between their country and the country of England. You see, a good many private bargains had been established between the king himself and powerful trading families on the continent of Europe. And we retain still yet today the records of these transactions in writing. They had no rights under the law according to the powers that be. For example, Henry II and his sons favored merchants from foreign lands in England, but also favored exacting from them in return the highest dues possible for the privilege of trading in England and making money, to the point that it became more than it was worth, and the traders began then to stay away. In the year 1181, Henry II obtained two falcons, for example, two falcons, worth a lot of money hunting falcons, for granting leave to export corn to Norway. That was from Englishmen. When I say corn, that's the old English word for grain. Then, when war had broken out between England and another country, Magna Carta requires that all foreign merchants and their goods, the king shall detain them, the executive power, that's the king, shall detain them in England until he is able to ascertain through his men sent for that purpose, his agents, and until he was able to ascertain how the country with which England was then at war, how that country was treating the merchants, the English merchants, there in that foreign country. And once that was done, then to treat the foreign merchants in England accordingly. For example, if the foreign country released all English merchants and their wares to come home, then John would release all foreign merchants in England at that time. All foreign merchants from the country with which England was at war released them to go home, along with their merchandise. This chapter 41 talks about evil tolls. That's a tax taken upon imports, often taken in kind. For instance, we learn that the custom at that time, when wine came from the continent of Europe on ships, anywhere from one to two casks, from 20 casks of wine, would be taken in toll, in tax. But John, the king of England, just as the powers that be sometimes would do today, would take whatever they wanted. It was an arbitrary rule. It was not fixed, and it was not enforced as fixed. It was a tax at the imperious breath of the powers that be without representation, without Parliament's permission, and in America it'd be without Congress's permission when those things happen. So we have here, in first principle, in substance, the very thing that our Constitution of the United States seeks to establish, and that is regular, regular trade under the Commerce Clause, for example, of our United States Constitution. And the regularity of trade among the states and foreign countries, and as it says, the Indian tribes, is made sure, our Constitution makes these sure, 
by the same principle here, Magna Carta, Chapter 41. Stay with us. This is Brent, Alan Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com. Please join us again next time, at this same time, here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network.